Hey, good morning, everybody, and welcome to another edition of Coffee with Tim. This morning, I want to talk to you just a little bit about some pictures in Psalms, and I tell you about uh, a pew in church, and um, so just grab yourself something to drink, and sit back, and enjoy this. You want to know who God is, but not sure where to begin. You want to learn about Jesus, have some coffee with Tim. So this morning, I'm, I'm right outside the activity center, the AC building here at America's Keswick. It's a Friday afternoon, evening, and I'm finished with my third three-week project here on the sewers at America's Keswick. And we got two weeks off, a two-week break uh, here. So... First week of conference season started. There's a five week conference season and it's been crazy active around here. And you know, last night there would have been dozens of people out here. The snack bar is right over here. The pool is in there behind me. I'm under this lighted tent. There's there's uh, games, all the kinds of games behind me, cornhole, different things all around me that people can be playing and, and have an ice cream and there's a barbecue pit, all kinds of campfires, s'mores, music, all kinds of things happening every night here. Every night. It's been crazy busy. And so I'm a little tired. I haven't been able to participate in all of it, but I am we're glad to have a weekend off. There's activities here tonight, but not like it's been. So that's where we're at. Thanks for joining me today on Coffee. Hi, this is in place of the progress report, and this might not even make it on the video, but I was hanging out with one of the guys in the colony. We're working in the same location, not together so much. Name's Billy, and Billy has got this canoe, a fiberglass canoe that the, the girls are using over at Barbara's place, and it's been damaged. It's got some chips and gouges, and I'm not sure if it was leaking or not. But his job was to to resurface, to sand it off, and resurface the exterior of the canoe, and uh, paint it, reseal it, so it'll be good to go for the girls. And he's working on his canoe. He's got it upside down. He's showing me the gouges. He's showing me he's, he's a craftsman. Billy's been gifted by God to be a craftsman. He's really skilled. So he's working on his canoe, and he's, and he's showing me all the details of how he's fixing it. And he actually he found the original name. There's a, uh, Underneath the, the paint that he's uh, sanding off, there's the, the original name of the canoe was painted on underneath a, a clear coat. And he found that. He's all excited about that. And I had been asking what he was gonna, if he's gonna put a new name on on the canoe, and I, I told him what I thought would be a good name, and he was smiling about that. But as he's doing this work, I, I, I pointed out to him a little a little image from Scripture, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works. That workmanship, that we are his workmanship, we are God's workmanship. The word workmanship is his poem, his masterpiece. God is at work on us, preparing us and so that we can do good works. And so I told Billy, you know, what you're doing here to this canoe, while you're doing, this is your good work, you're fixing this canoe. God is at work on you, fixing you, so you can do more and better good works. Be, make you more like Christ, make you more whole, make you more water worthy, make you prettier, more like Jesus, and you'll do more good works. And so the cool thing about God is he's not just interested in our works. He loves the works we do. Sometimes I think the works that we do are like my daughter, my kids would bring home crayon pictures that they colored and there'd be crayon outside the lines and it wouldn't make a whole lot of sense, but it was beautiful to me. And so I think sometimes our good works might not look so pretty to God, but he's just so proud of them because we did it from a heart to please him. And he's at work on us. We are his poem. He's more interested in our character and our looking like Jesus than he is in the good works that we do. But he gives us the good works to do because that's what he does. He does good works and he wants us to do the same kind of good works. But he's more, we are his workmanship, just like the canoe was Billy's workmanship. God's at work at us. Isn't that awesome? <laughs> so this morning, I was I was in the colony the other day working with the guys having lunch. I went in to see, actually today, I went in to see Jesse. He had a court date. I wanted to hear how his court date went. And I was talking to Jesse, and some of the guys were talking, so we started doing dad jokes. And so I'm going to repeat one 
that I heard. This is not from my daughter's book. This is a live and fresh one. And so it goes like this. When you fart in church, you sit in your own pew. Okay? I liked it. Thank you. The own pew. Okay, well, it looks like we're going to have company, so we're just going to have to deal with that fact. So this morning, I want to talk to you just a, a, a little bit about Psalms. I was reading my daily Bible reading app. It takes me through Psalms every day a little bit. And I come across this one Psalm that really was speaking to me, really stood out. I really saw something. And so I was sharing that with my wife. As we were discussing it, uh, we began to see a little pattern here in this little sections of Psalms. I just want to show that with you a little bit today. It's pretty cool. Psalms are a very unique kind of uh, scripture. They're poetic, but they're also prophetic. You can't really build doctrines completely on some of your Psalms, but there is a really good uh, imaging. There's like timestamp imaging from the future, in a sense. David is a type of Christ, and a lot of things David writes uh, are pre-quoting Jesus. Jesus on the cross says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? David pre-writes that. Different things, uh, just all kinds of scripture about Jesus on the cross are pre-written in the Psalms. And lots of imaging in the Psalms. That are, you can see a prophetic stamp, as it were. You can get a picture, an image overlaid onto the writer of Psalms. That's not just about what he's writing about in the present but it's a picture, it's a feeling picture of the future. That may be not word for word, line for line, but nonetheless, the images are there. It's like they're, they're images, prophetic images of the future. That's the best way I can say it. So the psalm I was reading was uh, Psalm 46. But we come back just a little bit farther. I want to show you this little pattern. If you read Psalm 44, and this is the problem with me doing this, is I want to put these scriptures on the screen, and it's late at night, I don't want to stay up till midnight typing scriptures, but I probably will. But in Psalm 44, if you read that Psalm, it's, it's about 25 verses, take, take you a few minutes. But the images you begin to pick up are, are, are suffering. People that are suffering, uh, feeling like God has not has rejected them, and they're, they're waiting. Why has God not answered us? Why are we suffering? And some of the imaging, uh, I'll read a couple of verses of it. For you, yet for your sake, we are killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. Awake, why are you sleeping, O Lord? Rouse yourself, do not reject us forever. Why do you hide your face? Why do you forget our affliction and our oppression? For our soul is bowed down to dust and our belly clings to the ground. Rise up, come to our help. Redeem us for the sake of your steadfast love. So it talks about a, a people that are being, that are suffering, persecution, suffering, rejection, and God has not come to their rescue. And there, there's, a, there's a, a longing, a crying out for this. And you can see two things. I can see the suffering of the Jewish people uh, from, the, from the time of Babylon on. They have suffered. Uh, even under Roman rule, they suffered and they were scattered again throughout the nations and they have suffered and suffered and suffered as a people. But more appropriately, more to, to the context of what I want to talk about, I see the martyrs in the book of Revelation. I see people suffering, being beheaded, suffering for their faith, and God is not doing vengeance. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, I will repay. And yet, they're, they're, we are like sheep being led to the slaughter. Where is this vengeance? Where is our God to, to take action on our behalf and rescue us? Rise up, O God. So you see a flavor. You get a, begin to get a flavor of that kind of suffering that the Scripture talks about in the book of Revelation during the tribulation period. And, and so just, just to throw that in, it's not as clear as what I'm about to go to. But when you put it, it's interesting to speculate. Even awesome, Dr. Jack Van Impey. So that's just a little flavor. And let me put it in context of the next Psalms. So if you, if you take that to, to, to speculate that maybe he's talking about the tribulation, persecution, and the martyrs that's happening. Then Psalm 45 is about the wedding feast of the Lamb. The imagery of this. And I'm not going to read the whole thing. But he's talking about... I'm going to read it, 
My heart overflows with a pleasing, pleasing theme. I address my verses to the king. My tongue is like the pen of a ready scribe. You are the most handsome of the sons of men. Grace is poured upon your lips. Therefore God has blessed you forever. Gird your sword on your thigh, O mighty one, in your splendor and majesty. In your majesty, ride out victoriously for the cause of truth and meekness and righteousness. Let your right hand teach you awesome deeds. Your arrows are sharp in the heart of the king's enemies. The peoples fall under you. Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of your kingdom is the scepter of uprightness. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness beyond your companions. Your robes are all fragrant with myrrh and aloes and cassia. From ivory palaces, stringed instruments make you glad. Daughters of kings are among the ladies of honor. At your right hand stands the queen in the gold of Ophir. Hear, O daughter, and consider and incline your ear. Forget your people and your father's house, and the king will desire your beauty. Since he is your lord, bow to him. The people of Tyre will seek your favor with gifts, the riches of the people. All glorious is the princess in her chamber with robes and her woven with gold. In many colored robes, she is led to the king with her virgin companions following behind her. With joy and gladness, they are led along as they enter the palace of the king. This is, in the place of your father shall be your sons, and you will make them princes over all the earth. I will cause your name to be remembered in all generations. Therefore, nations will praise you forever and ever. So in response to the suffering of the people, we have the first part of the psalm where the king is called to rise up and take his sword and execute uh, justice. And then the marriage of the marriage supper of the Lamb is the picture I see. I see the King Jesus marrying his bride as prophet. His bride is his church. Uh, he's called her out and he's having this this marriage to the to the, to his bride. This is happening at the same time things are happening on the earth. We have this marriage supper of the Lamb in, in 46. You get this picture. You get this stamp, this feeling of it. And then what, what happens after the marriage supper of the Lamb? Then we have the seals and bold judgments happening on the earth in the book of Revelation. How you doing, brother? How you doing? Good, man. So Psalm 46, this is the uh, judgment on the earth. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth gives way. Though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling. In imagery right out of the book of Revelation. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She will not be moved. God will help her when morning dawns. The nations rage. The kingdoms totter. He utters his voice. The earth melts the Lord of hosts is with us the God of Jacob is our fortress Selah again imagery right from the book of Revelation and then come behold the works of the Lord how he has brought desolations on the earth he makes wars cease to the end of the earth he breaks the bow and shatters the spear he burns the chariots with fire be still and know that I am God, I will be exalted among the nations, I will be exalted on the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us, the God of Jacob is our fortress. And you see in the book of Revelation, the wars have gathered, the nations have gathered to fight against each other and against the, And then Jesus comes and they turn their weapons against him. And Jesus comes and he slays them and he wipes out the, there will be no more, neither shall the nations learn war anymore. And he puts down the rebellion, and it's like all this clamor, all this anger, all this strife. And he says, be still. Just like he said, let there be light, and there was light. He says, be still. Like when the storms raged, and he calmed the storms when he was in the boat sleeping. And he got woke up. He comes right at the height of all this, all this war and aggression. And he says, be still. I will, and know that I am God. 
I will be exalted among the nations. And he takes over. He ends all the strife, all the rebellion of men. And he puts it to an end right there. So first you have the suffering of the saints. Then you have the marriage supper of the Lamb and the king getting ready to come to battle. And then you have the wars being, all this tumult being ceased by God as he comes. As he comes as a mighty warrior. And the imagery right straight. And you can find this imagery in the book of Revelation. Just almost identical. It's a picture, people. It's a, it's a impression of the future. And so you have these in order in Psalms. That was 44, 45, 46... And now Psalm 47, when the, when the king takes over, uh, the wars are over, he has established his kingdom. Listen, to, that's the next event after that in Revelation, Psalm 47. Clap your hands, all peoples, all peoples. Shout to God with the loud songs of joy, for the Lord the Most High is to be feared, a great king over all the earth. That's when he becomes the king. He subdued peoples under us and nations under our feet. He brings the Jews to the center and they, they become the ruling nation. And Jesus is king of the Jews and he's king over the whole world. He chose our heritage for us, the pride of Jacob, whom he loves. God has gone up with a shout, the Lord with the sound of a tr trumpet. Sing praises to God, sing praises, sing praises to our king, sing praises. For God is the king of all the earth, sings praises with a song. God reigns over the nations. God sits on his holy throne. The princes of the peoples gather as the people of the God of Abraham. For the shields of the earth belong to God. He is highly exalted. This is the beginning of the kingdom. God has finally, thy kingdom come, has come. And God rules. He rules over the nations. And he has elevated the Jews back to their place where they were promised that they would be the first of all the nations. And then the next image is of the New Jerusalem. And you'll see this in the book of Revelation. These are in order, prophetic pictures, psalm after psalm after psalm. 45, 46, 47, 48, even 44. 48. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. In the city of our God, his mountain, his holy mountain, beautiful in elevation, is the joy of all the earth. Mount Zion in the far north as the city of the great king. Within her citadels, God has made himself known as a fortress. For behold, the kings assembled, they came on together. As soon as they saw it, they were astounded. They were in panic, they took to flight. Trembling took hold of them there, anguish as of a woman in labor. By the east wind you shattered the ships of Tarshish, as we have heard, so we have seen in the city of the Lord of hosts, in the city of our God, which God will establish forever. We have thought on your steadfast love of God in the midst of your temple, as your name, O God, so your praise reaches to the ends of the earth. Your right hand is filled with righteousness. Let Mount Zion be glad. Let the daughters of Judah rejoice because of your judgments. Walk about Zion. Go around her. Number her towers. Consider well her ramparts. Go through her citadels. That you may tell the next generation that this is God, our God, forever and ever. He will guide us forever. So in those five Psalms, 44, 5, 6, 7, and 8, you see a picture, pictures right out of the book of Revelation. And I, my experience, what I've had God show up in my life and, and in a real present way in his spirit, I didn't hear words. I felt his emotion. I felt his desire. I felt his passion as if it was tangible to me. I felt his love for his church. God loves his people. God loves his church. And I felt that. And I think the writer of the Psalms has a similar kind of experience with God where he is impressed with the emotion and the pictures of the future, of God's passion, of God's future events. And he writes them down in the language of his day that he can. The Holy Spirit guides him to paint a picture of future events, of of, of impressions of the future, impressions of the Christ, the suffering, the plan of God. Pictures, pictures, pictures. So I encourage you, as you read your Psalms, uh, look for, look for what is, what is the picture here? And is that picture about something in the future or something that, on the cross, something that's already happened? What is this picture? Because it was very clear to me as I read those that that is a future event. The, the mountains being thrown into the sea. These images right out of the book, the, the earthquakes, the 
the ending of the wars, the breaking of the bow, uh, the ending of the rebellion, the king assuming his authority. It's just right out of the book of Revelation. You can see it. So that's my word today. Uh, check out the Psalms and feel the passion of our God. Feel the reality of the future. See if you can see what the psalmist sees. See if you can feel what the psalmist feels about what God is about to do on the earth. And I tell you, you best be on his side. He calls you to make him your refuge. Come unto me, all you ends of the earth, and look to me and, I, and be saved. For I am God, there is no other. He calls you to this refuge. Find your refuge in God now. Because when he comes in glory and in anger, you don't want to be outside. You want to be inside. You want to be under his arms, in his pinions, covered and safe. And that's what Jesus was all about. He came to seek and to save that which was lost and to restore. He is the ambassador. He is the mediator between God and men. And you must come to God through Jesus. He is the mediator. If you do that, he promises that he will not cast you out. He will no way cast out you out if you come through him. That's my call to you. Be ready. He's coming. Hear his voice. Feel his passion. Fear his name. There's another prayer, and I've had some great feedback this week. People I didn't know uh, have uh, were watching, reached out to me, and told me that somehow what I'm talking about is resonating with them and giving them an encouragement. So I'm just praising God for that. Father, I'm amazed at what you do with the words I speak. I don't even know sometimes that I'm on track at all, and yet I get the good feedback. And it's what it's about, Lord. It's not about me. It's about you building your church. It's about you adding people to your church numerically. It's about you building up the followers of Christ, building up them in their most holy faith, encouraging them to endure with patience the, the race set before us. And this race can be hard. I struggle. I struggle sometimes. Lord, it's hard for me to hold my faith. It's hard for me to hold the line and wait you out. Because uh, sometimes, as the psalmist said, it feels like, are you coming through? Are you with me, Lord? Are you with me? And yet, are you, as I told Matthew today, you've never let us down. You have never let us down. So let's hold fast our faith. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for each one who encourages me. May I be an encouragement to them, and may you encourage us all. Thank you that you have never lost one, Lord, except for the one that you were had to lose because the scripture had to be fulfilled. But those who come to you, you have saved everyone. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Be glorified. All right, homies, Catholics, people I don't even know, uh, family, coffee heads, love you. Thank you so much for your words of encouragement. I'm doing this for Jesus, and I'm hoping you're blessed by it. And stay in touch with me, and keep your eyes up, because he's coming soon. And that, 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 Lord willing, we'll see you next week. That is all, folks.